Thank you to Dr. Castro and Dr. Casimiro for convening today's session. Uh, just a little bit of context before we're beginning in earnest. This paper is part of a larger interdisciplinary project in which my colleague Leticia Rodriguez and I, Jason Vivret, are exploring the modern formation of a number of archaeological sites and archaeotouristic spaces in Turkey, including Ephesus, Mira, Phokea, and Assos, through a comparative lens that brings together the disciplines of archaeology and literature. Working with documents from the mid to late 19th century onward, our project combines field reports, excavation photography, and epigraphic materials with short stories, novels, travel writings, and literary translations. In doing so, we not only aim to trace how archaeological ruins like those found at Ephesus came to acquire a kind of sitehood in the late Ottoman Empire and early, early Turkish Republic, but we believe that there are also underexplored ways in which the emerging modern disciplines of archaeology, epigraphy, literature, and translation coalesced, intersected, and interacted at ruins and excavations in these lands. And then we can speak of a nexus of archaeological and literary practices that helped shape the contours of these sites. <clears throat> Today, we'll be focusing on two key texts in the development of Ephesus as a modern archaeotouristic space. Uh, <clears throat> one primary, primarily archaeological and the other literary. The first is the collected field, field reports of English architect and engineer John Turtle Wood, the first person to formally excavate and document Ephesus in the modern era. Published in 1877, these narrative reports catalog Wood's initial attempts to locate the ruins of the Temple of Artemis, <clears throat> Temple of Artemis, Diana, and subsequent excavation work throughout the landscape between 1863 and 1874. And we should add that Wood originally came to the region in 1858 when he was commissioned to design railway stations in Izmir in the environs. When he later shifted his attention to excavation at Ephesus, the railway he helped establish played an important role in his ability to transport, or displace, if you will, sculptures, inscriptions, and other finds from the site back to the coast, where they were ultimately shipped to England for display and storage in the British Museum. The second text of today's talk is a work of seemingly autobiographical fiction by Sabahattin Ali, a major literary figure of the late Ottoman Empire and early Turkish Republic, who, as a child, spent significant time along Turkey's Aegean coast during the years of the Turkish War of Independence. In this short story slash piece of travel writing, published in his final collection of short stories in 1947, just before his death, entitled Çirkince, after the name of a small Greek village in the hills outside of Ephesus, Ali, or rather his archaeophile protagonist, recounts his many visits to and deep nostalgia for the ruins at Ephesus. And interestingly, we learn that this protagonist makes use of the same railway and rail station that would help design some 70 to 80 years earlier. As we consider how archaeology and literature have intersected at ancient sites such as Ephesus and have at times worked together to remember particular narratives and layers of history at the expense of others, we are equally interested in exploring how these nascent disciplines engaged with questions of mobility and immobility in writings on, and indeed the writing of, archaeotouristic space in the Eastern Mediterranean. In other words, how new archaeological and literary practices helped codify and frequently privilege specific identities like the archaeologist and tourist that J.T. Wood and Sabahattin Ali respectively represent at Ephesus, and how these practices also marginalize supposedly transitory identities encountered on and around the site, such as seasonal workman, migrant, refugee, and brigand. In short, determining who could and should have access to the site, who is a valid and ongoing custodian of the ruins, and who was merely passing through. In thinking about questions of mobility, site access, agency, and identity, we have found Hélène Silverman's theory of the ruinscape to be a useful concept. In her research on cultural heritage contestations between local and national stakeholders around ancient temple monuments in Isan, Thailand, Silverman uses the term ruinscape as a way to describe how supposedly uninhabited ancient ruins on a landscape and the narratives later ascribed to them by official actors are regularly privileged over the interests of local living populations simultaneously occupying or subsisting on that landscape. In essence, the process of ruinscape formation entails the reorientation of a given space with its multiple entangled layers of history and heritage into a unified national narrative, often at the expense of local inhabitants with alternative memories and histories of engagement vis-a-vis -vis the space in question. Importantly, Silverman acknowledges that ruinscape formation is messy and that despite its best efforts, 
the ruinscape regularly fails to fully efface cultural layers at odds with its grand discourse. And this, and this heterogeneity is not merely a binary difference between the national and the local. For instance, in her research at the ruins of Pimai and the surrounding urban landscape in Thailand, Silverman observes that different generations of local inhabitants have very different experiential memories of the ancient temple terrain and interact with it through completely different rituals and activities. And while our own research at Ephesus is looking strictly at documents and narratives written from the perspective of privileged participants and subject positions in the ruinscape, that is, archaeologists and tourists largely aligned, aligned with the official heritage project of the site, if not the very authors of it, we feel that the longitudinal approach of pairing works written some 80 years apart, in this case between 1863 and 1947, and in response to the same site, provides an important uh, opportunity to trace those failed effacements and the messy displaced layers that poke through the cracks in the marble, so to speak. So let us turn our attention to J.T. Wood's collected field reports of 1877, entitled Discoveries at Ephesus. Uh, we'd like to begin by highlighting a passage from the introduction, which is illustrative of some of Wood's goals and methodological approach as an archeologist and documentarian of the site. Wood writes, in addition to the narrative of my work at Ephesus, I've appended a selection from the numerous Greek and Latin inscriptions which were discovered in the excavations. I have ventured also to adopt a new mode of indicating the restored portions of the inscriptions. Considering that brackets displace the letters of the text, disjoint the words, and create confusion. Every letter which does not actually exist on the stones has been carefully underlined. By this means, there is no displacement, and the inscriptions can be more easily read than they could have been if intercepted by brackets. <clears throat> and here's one example of Wood's underlining method. In the corner here, you can see it. Taken from the addendum of inscriptions to the excavation narrative, just to give you a sense of what this mode of transcription looks like. There are a few points that we'd like to focus on here. On the one hand, it's easy to see how Wood's new systematic approach to the documentation of epigraphy participates in a modern form of archaeology, one with scientific overtones and aspirations of objectivity. In Wood's view, it is clear from his avoidance of brackets and other such textual interventions that the archaeologist or epigrapher should insert his own interpretive hand as little as possible in the process of documenting finds like inscriptions. And by extension, presumably also in the process of documenting the entire site itself in narrative form, so as not to, quote, disjoint the words and create confusion. Implicit in such an approach is an assumption that the figure of the archaeologist stands somehow outside of the space of the site itself, separate from it in some way, so as not to disturb its natural order, and to endow the, ar the archaeologist with a kind of critical distance, even as he is the primary participant within the runescape to give definition to it as such. And yet, despite these ostensible concerns with scientific objectivity, there are many points throughout Wood's narrative where we can see uh, the archaeologist actively shaping the character of the site through what we, may, what we might call selective acts of memory. That is, the prioritizing and valorizing of particular layers of history and heritage at the site and the simultaneous dismissal and defacement of other layers. One need only look at Wood's summary of the history of Ephesus in chapter 1 to see this subjective approach at work with a strong preference for Greek layers. Wood writes, with other Ionian cities of Asia Minor, Ephesus fell into the hands of Croesus, the last of the kings of Lydia. And on the overthrow of Croesus by Cyrus, it passed under the heavier yoke of the Persian despot. Although from that time, during a period of at least five centuries, the city underwent great changes of fortune. It never lost its grandeur and importance. During the generations which immediately followed, the arts of Greece attained their highest perfection. But the small amount of Greek masonry, which has been found in excavations in the city, proves how recklessly the Romans destroyed the works of other hands than their own. Looking at the language we have placed in bold in this excerpt, we can see how Wood's history constitutes much more than a mere stratigraphic cataloging of the most prominent rulers and cultural layers of the site. Rather, it is clear from his highly subjective word choice that Wood would prefer to forget the despotic rule of the Lydians and the Persians, <clears throat> as well as the reckless stewardship of the Romans centuries later insofar as their presence at Ephesus only detracted from the grandeur of the Greeks and impeded his ability to locate the Temple of Artemis, which was his initial goal. The notion of overlooking or ignoring layers <clears throat> through archaeological practice 
if not physically removing them altogether to fit a specific narrative, is well known. And on this point, Leticia and I would direct your attention to Yanis Hamilakis and Raphael Greenberg's recent monograph, Archaeology, Nation, and Race, in a chapter on the metaphor of archaeology as purification in particular. In his discussion, Hamilakis notes that we can also productively think of purification, quote, as the removal of people from spaces colonized by archaeology and heritage practices. The cleansing of sites from living people, people who are seen as interfering with sites and monuments, who are out of place in these spaces of heritage, end quote. While Wood most certainly was not thinking of human beings when he expressed his concerns over displacement in epigraphic transcription, the question of displaced peoples, identities, and memories, and as perpetuated through archaeotouristic practice, is not out of place in a critical re-examination of Wood's work, and lies at the heart of our broader interest in issues of archaeological access, mobility, and immobility in the formation of Ephesus and other ruinscapes in Turkey. In fact, one of the most interesting episodes for us in the collective reports revolves around displaced local populations who, despite being completely marginalized in Wood's narrative, ironically play as central a role as any in the archaeotouristic economy of the, of the modern Ephesian ruinscape. As we noted before, <clears throat> Uh, the logic of Silverman's ruinscape sides with the inert ruins over the living, not least because it is easier to invest a space with a new narrative if it is deemed to be void of humans with their own cultural memories of and histories of engagement with that place. Wood himself makes the pronouncement that, quote, ancient Ephesus is now completely deserted. And yet only a few pages later contradicts himself, noting that while the original inhabitants were displaced from Ephesus due to the, quote, malaria from the marshes near the river Keister about two centuries ago, and took up their abode in the modern village of Kirkenji on the mountain range uh, bounding the east side of the plain, they currently still, quote, cultivate the land in the plain of Ephesus and now grow tobacco <clears throat> amongst the ruins of the ancient city. During excavations at the Great Theater in 1866, Wood comes across a wall covered with inscriptions, known as the Salutarian inscriptions, detailing a procession which made the complete circuit of the ancient city, which he then uses to locate the Temple of Artemis. In early 1868, he summons a ship and 22 sailors from England to come to Ephesus and haul away a number of accumulated antiquities, including the entire wall of inscriptions, using the local railway and port in Smyrna. <clears throat> in exchange for their hard labor and and help in transporting the inscriptions to the British Museum without damage, the sailors are paid by wood in the form of the local tobacco, a crop that, as we just noted, continues to be cultivated in the ruins themselves and by descendants of the original inhabitants of the ruinscape. And so we can see how, on the one hand, the labor of displaced peoples at Ephesus is deemed to be as valuable as key archaeological finds, such as the salutarian inscriptions, which ultimately helped to determine the boundaries of Ephesus as we know it today. And yet on the other hand, these original Ephesians <clears throat> are consistently described throughout the text as outsiders to Ephesus, precisely because their seasonal permeation, permeation of the site and migratory way of populating and working the ruinscape do not conform to official framings of the ruins as deserted or inert. Let us now turn to Sabahattin Ali's literary text, published in 1947 and entitled Chirkinje. And this is the Ottoman name for the Greek village of Kirkenji we just discussed from Wood's reports, the use of which has been documented from at least the early 18th century. Written from the perspective of a seasoned train traveler in his late 30s who regularly visits the ancient ruins of Ephesus, the story opens with the following lines. Gece yarısını bir saat gece, al sancaktan kalkıp, Ankara'ya gidecek olan tren için birkaç gün önce bilet almıştım. Nedense aklıma esti. Son günü İzmir'de kalıp dolaşmaktansa sabah treniyle Selçuk'a gider. Efesos harabelerini gezer, akşam ederim. Gece yarısı nasıl olsa oradan geçecek olan Ankara trenine biner, yoluma kuyulurum dedim. Öyle de yaptım. Together with the freedom of mobility captured in these few lines, it is remarkable to note here the degree to which Ephesus has already become a full-fledged archaeotouristic site to visit in the young Turkish Republic, albeit from a presumably elite Turkish traveler. 
Uh, as in Wood's collected excavation reports, it is likewise interesting that our Turkish protagonist also favors the Greek layers of the site as he wanders the ruins. Wood himself had at least acknowledged that, quote, indeed under the Roman, uh, Roman dom dominion, all the public buildings, including the theaters and gymnasia, must have been erected. And yet our 1940s visitor views the monuments in Hellenic terms exclusively, describing them as the remains of, quote, radiant ancient Greek civilization, the likes of which the world had never seen again. This is our translation. In addition to being a writer of novels and short stories, Sabah Tin Ali is well known for his work as a translator of literature. In 1941, Ali had been commissioned to translate Sophocles' tragedy of Antigone into Turkish as part of a larger initiative by the Turkish Board of Education to make classics of world literature and ancient Greek works in particular available to Turkish readers. Then President of the Republic, Ismet Inonu, himself provided a foreword to the first edition of the translation, in which he emphasized the primacy of ancient Greek artistic and intellectual life and its value for the culture of the fledgling, fledgling Turkish nation. Although, although this presidential foreword has since been removed from subsequent editions of Antigone in Turkish, making for an interesting case study in displacement and defacement in its own right. Sabahattin Ali actually thematizes the wiping away of this privileged Greek player in his short story. While the title of his tale is Chirkinje, this Ottoman name for the local Greek village of Kirkenci was only in use until 1928, when in accordance with modernization policies of the newly established Turkish Republic that included a nationwide Turkification of foreign sounding toponyms, the name of the village was further altered to Shirinje by the governing bodies in Izmir. The Hellenophile protagonist is shocked by the state intervention during his visit to Ephesus, not least because of the ironic wordplay involved. Based on Turkish morphology, Chirkinje sounds like it means something like in an ugly way, whereas Shirinje would mean something like in a sweet and pleasing way, which is incongruous with the protagonist's experience of the complete decay of his Greek ruins. To conclude, we would like to return to our touristic site visit as a way of coming full circle with our exploration of mobility and displacement in the formation of the Ephesian ruinscape. As Ali's archaeophile makes his approach from the train station to, as he puts it, the, quote, ruins of the dead city, uh, and we emphasize dead here, the ruins of the dead city, uh, he observes the following. Her izmire gelişimde muhakkak bir kere uğradığım bu harabeler Sanki seneden seneye daha ahrap buluyor. Coşkun, e, coşkun bayramların, spor oyunların kutlandığı hipodromun göbeğine muhacirler tütün ekmişler. Kenarındaki kuru yapraklı bir çardağın altında sıtmadan tit, e, titreşerek yatıyorlardı. Pardon, excuse my trip ups there. Uh, here we have a clear evidence. We have clear evidence of the continued seasonal practice of planting and harvesting of tobacco in the ancient ruins, and over the course of at least 80 years at the site, despite claims by both authors that the ruins are now, quote, completely deserted or dead. Ali's use of the term uh, muhajir lar is notable, though, as it implies that these displaced peoples undertaking this agricultural labor are no longer the original Greek villagers, but most likely mubadil lar, or another group of displaced peoples, namely the ethnic Turkish refugees forcibly transferred from Greece to the Turkish coast as the result of the Greek-Turkish population exchange, the largest waves of which took place in 1923, which co coincides with the founding of the Turkish Republic. It has been well documented that these predominantly agrarian populations of relocated Greek and Turkish migrants on both sides of the Aegean were expected to subsist as farmers with the local crops of their new homelands, and that lacking the necessary knowledge and skills, they regularly failed at doing so. As much as Ali's protagonist would prefer to erase these non-Greek and still living inhabitants from his idealist memory of the ruinscape, <clears throat> these displaced communities never, nevertheless persist, along with the practices of the now twice displaced Greek inhabitants of Ephesus and Kirkinje, Chirkinje, Shirinje that Wood attempted to marginalize in his own writing of the privileged layers and identities at the site. As Ali puts it, like the overgrown roots of blackberry bushes bursting between the marble, marble paved streets, cracking and shattering those white stones that thousands of years had failed to smother, the memories of these supposedly marginal yet ever-present local identities are not so easily effaced. Thank you.